<laughs> Brilliant. Welcome, everyone, to uh, this very different uh, Tuesday Spotlight. Uh, it's more of a discussion panel. Uh, we have our uh, two speakers here today, Dr. Stephanie Boonstra and Dr. Campbell Price. Uh, they are the editors of the next very exciting EES publication on its way to you next year, Ancient Egypt in 50 Discoveries. It'll be 50 highlights uh, of artifacts discovered over the uh, first century, I suppose, uh, of the Egypt Exploration Fund and Society. Um, and today we're just going to be talking about the first five highlights from the book. Uh, so only 10%, so a bit, only a bit of a teaser for you all, really. Um, but it's a very informal event today. We've got our speakers. Stephanie is joining us from Cairo, uh, where she's actually been to see some of the objects that are mm. going to feature in the book in the Egyptian Museum. So um, they'll be fresh in her mind. Um, and we've got a wonderful audience on Zoom as well. So for the benefit of those watching the recording back on YouTube, uh, the chat is uh, open. So I will do my best, I promise, uh, to read out the questions that we've got in the chat so that you watching it back uh, on YouTube will understand what we're answering, because uh, sometimes mm -hmm. there's a, a temptation to just read uh, in our minds. So we've got the five objects out in front of us, um, and I'm going to kick off with uh, my personal favorite on the screen, uh, which is this gorgeous uh, small ivory statuette of Khufu. Um, and Campbell, I wonder if you can tell us uh, a little bit more about this statuette. Yes, well, hello everyone, thanks for joining. Um, well, it's great pleasure to be with you. I guess the idea for this book, and Stephanie, Stephanie and I were working on it already for quite a while, it came out of a course I did, the first online course, um, kind of early stages of the pandemic, which was Ancient Egypt and 50 EES objects. And it was one, this is one I just had to include, because it's one that if you've ever been to the Egyptian Museum in Cairo, guides go towards it is something that is remarked upon because of the irony that this is the only known facial representation not a portrait simply a representation of the builder of the you know the greatest arguable greatest monument and from pharaonic times now i have to i was thinking about this before this evening you know if we were talking about the history of the ees in 50 anythings, I mean, they could be 50 landscapes, they could be 50 experiences, they could be uh, 50 people. But we chose 50 objects because the reality of, of fieldwork, especially in that earlier part of the society and the fund's activities, was in the yield of objects. And I think it's fun, especially for those of us working with collections, to match things and try and put in some sort of context the things found in the course of those excavations uh, by many Egyptian men, women, children, and non-Egyptian archaeologists as well, to try and put them in uh, context. The reason I would highlight this one, and I'm so glad this is one of the first that we're looking at, is, fun fact... This image, which I think the archive photo on the left really catches the work, the very, very fine-grained wood and the very detailed work in the wood. This, ladies and gentlemen, was a inspiration for the 1950s movie Land of the Pharaohs. Jack Hawkins plays Khufu and his costume is partly inspired by this kind of truncated red crown although it's gold because isn't everything gold and I just love that this tiny little object which is only yay big in ivory inspired this big glamorous incredibly over the top camp movie with the wonderful Dame Joan Collins OBE in it so is it is it late period is it fourth dynasty the jury is still out the detail of the the crown curving around the ear is consistent with both original Fourth Dynasty depictions. People like Snefru are shown um, uh, Khafre, a likely Khafre image. Uh, Khufu's successor is shown with this kind of crown. But then equally, th that kind of thing is copied in the late period. You know, 2,000 years later in the 26th Dynasty, there's archaism going on. 
deliberate copying. I'm rabbiting on, Steph. What what do you think about it? I don't know. I I love this little statuette, and um, I know that when we were initially talking about it, I absolutely deferred to you, Campbell, as uh, statuary is not not my strong suit, but everybody who knows you knows it's yours. Um, and I was saying, like, why why do people think it would be twenty six dynasty? Mm. Wouldn't it make more sense for it to be old kingdom? That it, I don't know. What, I guess because there was the the cult of. Um, that particular king in Khufu in Dynasty 26, mm. we know. But then the story of the finding of it. Yeah, that's my favorite. Yes. And I think when we both discussed it, that is a really interesting story of exactly where and how it was found. So it's torture in a way to do this book because you have a limited word length <laughs> to um Word limit to uh, to discuss the interesting stories and the people behind the discoveries. Mm. I wonder how many people uh, attending uh, in Zoomland? I wonder how many of you already knew that this was discovered by the EES. Because um, obviously you go to the Egyptian Museum and there's crowds and crowds of people circling this teeny tiny uh, ivory statuette. Um, but I don't know how many of them actually are aware that this was found at Abydos and not at Giza. Um, and th th that uh, idea of discovery that you just mentioned, the fact that it was found in two separate parts. And I love the fact that um, I put a little detail on the slide, if I can get it to move along, um, just blown up the Ooh, uh, nice. name down uh, by his lower right hand, uh, right leg. Um, and of course, you know, Petrie must have read that and then thought, oh, my word, where's the rest of it? Like, where's the face? Um, so are there any comparable um, examples like this, maybe not from the reign of Khufu, like for other pharaohs of the fourth dynasty? Oh, there's a good question. Um, there are other named things that, you know, carry the name of the king. I mean, a good example is a coffin belonging to Menkauri, so the owner of the third and smallest pyramid of Giza. The, to all intents and purposes is his coffin. It's got his name on it, and it's got nice text. But it's 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 two thousand years later than um, Min Kauri lived and died, and I guess it's the same spirit of this archaism. You get it more. There are examples from Karnak, so not that far away from Abydos where this was found, where you have later kings explicitly saying, "I have dedicated this statue of Sinmozer the first uh, some other Middle Kingdom king to make myself look good. So that's what the su supposition is. This is a kind of a votive donated by someone unnamed to the temple at Abydos, which was very old, very ancient, had been occupied and used for a long time, you know, before the reign of Khufu. God, Abydos is the, is the burial place of all the early kings, First Dynasty and mm -hmm. before. I love the idea of like dedicating a statue of like your forebears. Is it like um, a generational trauma story that Disney would jump on at some point? <laughs> <laughs> maybe, Carl. Maybe. Um, but but you, you highlighted, Carl, and I, I think that's really, uh, uh, you can imagine the scene. When Petrie found the body, he basically said, right, everybody stop. We now have to find the head. And through, I think it was two weeks, he says, of three sifting. Weeks. Was it two weeks, Steph? Three. Three weeks. Three weeks they found it. That is a needle in a hay haystack situation. I think the, the, the quote is incessant sifting or something. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Three weeks of incessant sifting. I feel like that's something like British Bake Off, you know, you must now <laughs> incessantly sift your flour or something. <laughs> so I must say, it sounds like torture. <laughs> So the book includes um, these items, you know, clearly connected to royal uh, ideology, this sort of centralization of power into uh, one being, as it were. Um, but it also includes some of the more uh, items that we might think of as daily life, but maybe still, you know, nonetheless quite elite. So I'm going to jump to the other end of the, the spectrum to this, I think, rather adorable and somewhat um, sort of hipsterish looking uh, sock. <laughs> Um, and Steph, I think you've uh, done a bit of research on this one. 
Yeah, um, and if we think of the Khufu statuette as fourth dynasty, although Campbell did flag up that it might not be, we're now jumping kind of to the other end of the spectrum um, chronologically. And so this is a, a beautiful little sock that is at Leicester Museum and Art Gallery, and it's very little known, very little published. Um, on account of it being a, from a, in a small council museum, uh, but um, it was found by the ES in 1913-1914 uh, 1914 season at Antinoopolis um, by the ES Greco-Roman branch, um, and at that point, um, this excavation was run by John Demonens Johnson. Um, and the it was funny in the in the minutes of the the meetings. Um, the, the Greco-Roman branch had had quite an unsuccessful excavation um, a couple of years prior, and they said, okay, fine, we'll, we'll let uh, Demonis Johnson um, do a season at Antinoopolis. Like, there might still be some fines there, like, all right, have a go. Um, and it's quite apologetic. Um, and uh, Johnson systematically excavated the site in the same way that his predecessors of the Greco-Roman branch, which we'll talk quite a bit about the Greco-Roman branch in the book, um, so I'm not going to go into too much detail now, um, but quite systematically looking specifically at the rubbish dumps. So they knew that there was a lot of discarded papyri, particularly from the Greek period, um, in these rubbish dumps. So uh, Johnson and his team went to the rubbish dumps of, of Antinoopolis or Antinoe um, and started excavating them. And they did find papyri and some amazing papyri, including a beautiful one that will also be highlighted in the book, um, but no spoilers there. Um, but they also found lots of objects from daily life that had been discarded. And so most of these were ones that um, no longer were in use or were broken. And so this is a knitted child sock um, that was found. Um, and so it's it's funny because the sock uh, has one um, area for the big toe and then one um, for the little toe. So it's kind of like a mitten, but for feet. Um, and it must have been really warm. So I wonder maybe in the winter, I mean, those of you who have spent um, a winter uh, in Egypt knows how cold it can get at night. And so I'm sure these would have been lovely, but the pattern is stunning. Um, the colors, the textiles, uh, and it's just such a beautiful um, kind of, picture of, of daily attire. Um, and this is dates to the 5th, 6th century AD or, or CE. So it's much, much later, but this is the kind of um, kind of Coptic and Greek uh, settlement uh, at the time. But what fabulous clothing. <laughs> yeah, they're amazing. Awesome. And um, just picking up on something you said at the start, you know, that this is uh, something on display in a maybe a lesser known collection and I know that's something that both of you uh, when you've compiled the the list of artifacts or the list of discoveries let's say not necessarily just artifacts for the book uh, you've been quite keen on surfacing some of those lesser known collections are there any others other than Leicester that you want to tease us with? Well, other collections that like that we'll use in the book. Well, I mean, we could go to another one of the highlight objects. So, oh, um, it's so if we go to um the beautiful glass vase that mm. is in the National Museum of Denmark. So it's across the street from the Glyptotheket. Um, but it's an amazing um little piece uh, that was discovered by the EES uh, in 1930 to 31 um, by uh, John Pendlebury's team at Amarna. Uh, and specifically it was found in quite a famous context, but the context was so famous that the, this bottle ended up being kind of ignored. It's a stunning um, multicolored glass bottle. And uh, those of you who know anything about the history of glass, you'll know that um, Amarna was one of the earliest um, kind of centers of ancient glass. Um, and a, a lot of people that, that study Egyptian glass focus their work at Amarna, uh, including people like Anna Hodgkinson. Um, 
And so we're able to use this object to kind of highlight uh, the origins of glass and the production of glass in Egypt, because we have so much evidence for workshops at Amarna. Uh, but this beautiful uh, vase was found in T-34-4, uh, which is a grid square demarcation of the city. But if you know, um, you might recognize that because it's from the house of Hatiai, which is uh, was in the northern suburb of the city, and it's very famous for another Another object, uh, which I won't mention, you might know it, but it will also feature in the book. Uh, and I also had a look at it today uh, in oh. the Cairo Museum. Uh, awesome. Yeah, still beautiful. I'm um, mm -hmm. excited to, to share that entry with everyone. But um, it's really funny because the House of Hattiai was kind of um, the house itself, which uh, is well published, and then it's courtyards. And this beautiful glass vessel was found in um, the eastern courtyard of the house. And I was reading through the um, publication um, today, and Pendlebury says, the grounds to the east call for little comment. And other than mentioning this bottle in a list, he doesn't he doesn't talk about it at all, which is crazy to me because look how beautiful it is. And look at the archive um, that we have of this. This is an in color object card. Most of our object card documents are not in color. So it's really stunning. I love is, this piece. Is this the period that um, Mary Chubb was at Amana? Yes. Yeah. So maybe she uh, threw painted it. So yeah, I, I don't know, maybe. I mean, she was a, an amazing artist, so it, it seems highly likely that this object card could have been made by her. When I saw that object card first, Stephanie, I thought you'd mocked it up. I thought it was a mock-up for the book. But that you is think, actually you the think original. too highly of me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have those skills. Yeah, it's that's really record. Ops, like well we're, we're still discussing uh, cover images the thing i like about this particularly <laughs> is if you think about that kind of glass you think of that famous fish in yes. the british museum and yeah often you know there are some pieces which are iconic and are included in the book but then there are others using a different technique or representing the same it's the same technique or it's the same person and it, it was fun to to shed light on the slightly less well-known Mm, absolutely yeah it's interesting because i think the, the fish i think is also an es amana discovery mm. but i've yes. checked before the object card for that has no drawing on it and i've often wondered if it was just a bit too complicated mm. <laughs> they just thought no it's not happening but not even the, chance, the yeah. natives don't really have a good image of the fish either so it's nice to have this piece i think i agree with you steph like because even when you flip through the object cards and there's like seven and a half thousand of them uh scanned by catherine pavers it's nice to have catherine's picture of the uh, vessel as well um you know to flip through them and then this one really does pop at you and i think it was the pop of the object card that caused catherine to actually go and visit the object as well uh, so it's nice to sort of see how the archive informs you know how people interact with collections as well so will the archive be an important part of the publication as well will you be incorporating that within the object records absolutely yeah i think any publication about discoveries made by the ees means it's such a great opportunity to talk about the actual discovery itself and not just the object because a lot of the objects throughout the book might be published somewhere else and um this this vessel might be published in a book about glass, but they, they won't talk about the discovery and, and things like that. So it's just so nice. And I think this, the story of the discovery adds a real human aspect to it. People can, can kind of associate more with it and they're great stories. And I also think that these are interesting stories that even people that aren't Egyptologists or particularly interested in Egyptology will find interesting because they're in really interesting anecdotes. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. There's a, um, a little discussion happening in the chat. I don't know to what extent you can both follow along. Uh, Kathy has said uh, the object card is as much a work of art as the vase itself. And I, I think that's absolutely true. Uh, and Susan 
uh, has uh, confirmed the stitch used on the, the oh, sock yes. that you spoke about, Steph. Um, she says it looks like a stocking stitch, uh, knit a roll, pearl a row. I don't know anything about knitting, so I'm gonna. <laughs> Do you know how to knit and pearl? <laughs> um, actually, there is um, a publication I think by Elizabeth O'Connell where she actually describes the 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 rows. So uh, you could yeah. potentially uh, knit a new one. I'm hoping for some new winter warmers this year. <laughs> yeah, someone else is going to have to do that beyond my skills. <laughs> I can so we, knit scarves. The, I can knit scarves and that's it. <laughs> we have a, in Manchester Museum, we have a comparable sock, which, I mean, has attracted so much attention by people, from people who just want to sit and yeah, look at the, the stitching. And I think it's the same with Ooh. this example we've chosen uh, that's now in Leicester. It just looks like it's fallen out of someone's knitting bag and it's yeah. going to be finished and gifted for Christmas so yeah there is that human connection which is important so talking mm. about this um, human connection um, uh, there's uh, an object on the screen that sort of uh, looks like it could bring in two ancient people to play a bit of a, a game um, though I suspect that I may be generalizing a little bit but this I, I hadn't realized this was an ES um, a discovery um, but I think it's absolutely stunning I imagine it's been quite heavily reconstructed um, mm. but yeah I don't know which one of you wants to tell me a little something about the senate, senate board I'm happy to start so this was discovered um, at Abydos and we know there's a lot, so much out of Bidos, um, in a tomb. Um, but it's really interesting. So it has been reconstructed. Um, the wood is all modern, but the faience tiles are almost all original. There were a couple of reconstructed ones. Um, and you can see in the archive photo to the left uh, where some of the tiles were missing. Um, and it's really interesting that you showed these two photos because the one on the right, you can see, oh, it's a, it's a game of Senate and Senate has 30 square squares. Um, but then if you flip it over, it has 20 squares and that game is called 20 squares. So I love the idea that this is a board game that you can flip over. It's like when um, you get those travel sets of, of games that, that you can play multiple games on it. And I just love that. It's so practical. Um, and it's got this lovely drawer that you could store the pieces in the game pieces. Um, and we do know Senate was a really popular game. Um, they played it as early as the third dynasty. Um, and um, I've even read recently about um, at quarry sites where we know that there were guards uh, sitting people carved senate boards into the stone so assume like presuming the the guards could play with each other while they were bored and i just i find that so fascinating however um as this was found in a tomb i mean it could have been the tomb owner's prized possession or it could have been the kind of other aspect of senate um and uh senate quite strongly um uh, evoke spell 17 of the book of the dead which um uh it, or it, it's often used in spell 17 of the book of the dead um in which uh in the vignette you would see the the deceased playing uh senate by themselves and it symbolizes um the hope of the deceased to continue in contact with the living in the afterlife so they're kind of playing with an invisible living person. Um, and so it's always shown in these underworld texts and tomb scenes, and there are quite famous depictions of Senate being played solo. Um, and uh, it, yeah, it's it's uh, really interesting, but it is it is a fun game as well. So it's in, it, I think so much of ancient Egypt was that 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 practical aspect of life, but also evokes the, the religion and the afterlife. So a lot of things have this kind of two tone, um, multi-purpose act. But um, one thing I will quickly say is that we do have a digital resource on the ES website uh, with instructions of how to play Senate. Um, so I don't know if Carl can share that or we could send that in the follow-up email um, and put it on the YouTube link probably. Um, but yes, yeah, so if you want to have a go out playing Senate, it's quite fun. Um, but yeah, the, the kind of find it. <laughs> yeah, traveling through the uh, game board is like traveling through the afterlife. Um, I might even be able to share it. Uh, although it, yeah. let's, who know? Okay. Cause I, I don't want to, I don't want to chance my internet connection. It's, I, I think <laughs> yeah, it's been so far. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. No, I think that's really impressive. And it, I, I like the fact that there's this mix between um, maybe lesser known collections. And then here we've got uh, an item gloriously reconstructed in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. Yes. Um, of course, they have these amazing um, digital images available. And anyone who's interested in looking through the Met catalog will find you can you can use them wherever you like. So they're really quite amazing. Um, but of course, then there are items in collections which do not have currently good photography available. And we're very lucky to fall back on the archive. Um, but of course, that, you know, the book should show all sides of this. So we want to show the archive and the discovery, but also where the objects are now. So a uh, huge thanks to everybody uh, attending or watching this on the recording that's already contributed to the uh, appeal this year. Um, that funding will not only go towards the production of the book, but will also enable us to source new photography for a lot of the objects that are in there, in some cases, completely unpublished uh, items. So that's going to be really exciting. Um, if you've not yet contributed uh, and you would like to contribute or you would like your name in the book, uh, there is still time to make a donation. So I'm going to put the link in the chat and I'll make it available on the uh, YouTube recording as well. Very grateful for any uh, funds that anybody can uh, support the book with, because, of course, the more that we can raise for the book, the more we can do with the book. So as Campbell said, we're still talking about cover images and a lot of that will depend on the funds available. So huge thank you to everybody that's already contributed. And this is a good example, Carl, um, of, yeah, something where you can see the piece closer to when it was found. There are cases of objects and discoveries in the book where you can really see the kind of tidied up moment of discovery. I know it's not the actual moment of discovery, but close to it. But that was a kind of intermediary stage in black and white. You think, oh, I see. OK, it's Senate board. But then um, because that object featured in the, the 50 objects course I ran, I just found it so attractive as an object. Beautiful. In color. It's those colors are like you would want to play that game, whether it was actually played with or not. Um, is, is kind of immaterial. I always imagine the great Swedish film director Ingmar Bergman's uh, masterpiece, The Seventh Seal, uh, with the late great Max von Sydow, a Swedish actor, and he plays this game of chess with death. And there are kind of <laughs> cultural, as Steph said, cultural evocations in the Book of the Dead and in later literature about having a game of Senate, um, which, yeah, there's this nice little, yeah, two-tone I like that. Yeah. It can be life. It can be practical. Tone, yeah. can be <laughs> I'm sure two tone else. wasn't the, the correct verbiage, but I have been up since no, 4 a.m. So <laughs> my brain's but, not working. And I suppose that brings us quite nicely onto the last uh, artifact or discovery um, that we've got on the screen, which um, is slightly more about death, although um, <laughs> yeah. arguably. Uh, you know a bit more about what people living might have been doing it with it um and Campbell I know you're uh the expert on animal mummies uh and this oh, well, so over to you on this one maybe not an expert but I've been lucky at Manchester to work with experts um Lydia McKnight and Stephanie Aston Willem who were able to use the EES archive not just to find new pictures uh, and drawings of objects but to really literally dig into the details double triple puns here um of where they were found so um back when i was a student i, I did geophysical field work at the site of Saqqara, and we were mapping basically the areas around and the areas on top of um and underneath uh the places that ees excavations had taken place at Saqqara in the 1960s 1970s especially so this is one of a very common, and by very common, I mean, we're talking about tens of millions of these things, um, objects originally produced. And it's uh, a mummified ibis bird from the great, vast, sacred animal necropolis uh, at Saqqara, which was essentially, you know, a giant mummified zoo. If you could kill it, you could mummify it. And yes, there were cats. Um, mm -hmm. But there were dogs, there were ca uh, crocodiles, there were scarab beetles. Um, and this is an ibis bird, sacred uh, to the god Thoth, um, god of learning, god of wisdom, god of writing, maybe associated with Imhotep, a name which looms very large at the site of Saqqara, and which featured largely in the mind of Walter Brian Emery, a Liverpool 
educated archaeologist, Egyptologist who worked for the EES and who wanted to find the legendary tomb of Emhotep. He sadly never found it, or at least if he found it, he didn't know it was definitely belonging to Emhotep. And so this profusion of ibis bird mummies suggested to Emery that he was in the right place because the ibis bird had the association with Thoth. We know in the late period, Imhotep had the title Chief One of the Ibis. So all of these kind of details were leading leading um, Emery on. Sadly, Emery died uh, before he made the find and, and repeated attempts, including by the late great Ian Matheson, uh, to locate the tomb of Im Imhotep have come to naught. So this is an object which both, it, of course, it's a mummified creature and it's very much about religion but it also is a reflection of the in extraordinary industry of votive making which was located at the site of Saqqara and really a significant chapter in the society's excavation history which continues the, the archive the incredible archive produced by Emery and others continues to be a source of great scholarly interest Absolutely. And I think it was just the focus of a recent archive scanning project. So it, it, even the archive continues to give new discoveries. Um, is it is it normal, Campbell, to have this sort of applique uh, design on the front of the mummy? This is a Ferrari of an <laughs> animal mummy. <laughs> this is really top end. But it's interesting talking to um, Lydia and uh, Stephanie atherton Willem about what they, so they had looked over a thousand animal mummies and they found a third of them contained no animal remains at all. Mm. Another third had part of an animal and the final third contained the complete skeleton of an animal. Um, I don't think this has got much of an ibis going on in, inside it. But, and it's interesting that the really fancy appliques, yeah, these, these details of images of gods, um, we have Man one in Manchester that is thought this, well, this may be the goddess Hathor, because she's got a sun disk on her head, or it may be, in fact, the goddess Isis, who at Saqqara is worshipped as the mother of the Apis bull. So it kind of draws from the local mythology. Um, mm. You've got to imagine pilgrims are going and buying these things, you know, wanting to donate them to the gods and hoping it doesn't matter what's inside. I don't think that's important. But I think if you have a fancily wrapped, and the wrapping is quite stupendous. You've got an image there on the right, Carl, showing, you know, an attempt to understand the bandaging, the outer bandaging. We tried at Manchester to do an experimental archaeology succession live in front of a live studio audience. It's hard to wrap one of those blighters up. You need three sets of people, three hat sets of hands. Wow. Do it. Mm, I can't even wrap a Christmas present. So <laughs> Me neither. <laughs> Ironic yeah. Egyptologist. Um it's absolutely stunning. Well, I, I think the, the five um discoveries that you, you picked for, for the session really give that variety that's gonna be in the book. And I'm excited. Uh, to see what else is going to be there. Um, thank you again to everybody uh, attending today, watching this on the recording. Uh, we've already raised uh, just over thirteen and a half thousand pounds towards the production of the book, which is an incredible amount. Uh, so huge thank, thank you. you. The target is fifteen thousand, so there's still time to help us reach that target. Uh, we really do want to reach that um, before the end of November. So thank you to everybody that's already helped us get there. Um, as a little prize for everybody watching now, and it will be on the YouTube channel, and I've just put it on the website, uh, I am pleased if I can get it to work to release uh, or tease you all with the next five um, right. artifacts or discoveries. Uh, so go and check that out on the ES website. Um, do um, uh, have a look at them in the museum websites if you can. Uh, the, it does allow us another opportunity to share this amazing uh, relief of uh, Monte Hotep Nepepet Ray from Dirol Bafri, which is now in the Metropolitan Museum. Um, I think anybody who follows ES events will know it's one of my favourites because it keeps cropping up quite a lot. Um, yeah. but I do love it. So thank you both for joining the session today. Thank you especially to Stephanie for joining yeah. us all the way from Cairo because I know you're up early tomorrow to actually go to a 
Mana. So, <laughs> oh, uh, enjoy your field work after your holiday. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you for, for making the time. Not sure that's the right way around anyway. And uh, have a great time. Thank you again to everyone joining us uh, on Zoom for the live session. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you in another ES event very, very soon. And hopefully sending you this book in 2024. Inshallah. 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 <laughs> uh, take care, everyone. Thank you so much, everyone. Have Thank a good night. you. Thanks, very soon. I need to find a way of stopping this. <laughs>